All right. Uh, my name is Michael Hartle. Some of you may know me as the author of the Ruby on Rails tutorial. I, I wanted to let you all know that I recently finished an introductory tutorial to Ruby, just by itself, called Learn Enough Ruby to be Dangerous. Uh, it has a lot of the things you'd expect from an introductory Ruby tutorial, uh, but there are uh, several novel things, including a gentle introduction to web development with Sinatra, uh, shell scripting, and uh, making and publishing a Ruby gem with testing and test-driven development. Uh, it is suitable for beginners, but also good after the Ruby on Rails tutorial. Uh, you can check it out at learnenough.com slash Ruby. And uh, partially as a celebration of finishing this tutorial, tonight I'm hosting the eighth semi-annual Rails tutorial beerware night at the Bonaventure Brewing Company, which is just a short walk from here. That's between six and eight. You can find out uh, about that event and what the beerware license is at my pinned tweet, twitter.com slash mhartle. So I hope to see some of you there. Um, okay, so hi, my name's Kristen. I'm going to talk really, really fast to cram, cram this in. So I currently work for a great company called Stitch Fix, um, but previously I found myself running into some situations which were difficult and painful in either school or past jobs where I was trying to learn, communicate, or receive help. Now that I'm in a culture where learning and asking questions are embraced, I decided to look back and see how we could possibly correct these painful situations. That is where I stumbled upon the concept of beginner's mindset. So beginner's mindset is characterized by openness, eagerness, and the lack of preconception. It helps you to do a lot of things. You become more creative and a more objective problem solver, a better communicator, and a better teacher. Break down walls with other people and become a safe person to talk to as well as to ask questions to because you'll be doing a lot of that yourself. So what I will say is that if I would have had someone who had this kind of mindset when I was having those painful situations, it probably would have been a lot better and I probably would have learned things a lot sooner and not felt so bad about the situation in general. So this is my PSA to have you keep this in the front of your mind and I have a bunch of ways to do this. So feel free to stop by the Stitch Fix booth or just hunt me down throughout the conference and I'd love to have a conversation about it. Thanks guys. So hi everyone, I'm Tori. I'm a software apprentice at Pillar Technology in Des Moines, Iowa, and I help co-organize Des Moines Web Geeks and Lady Dev, and you can find me on Twitter at Tori Story. So today I'm going to talk to you about crocheting and coding and how I believe they're similar. So the style of crocheting that I like to do is called amigurumi, and it's a Japanese style of crocheting or knitting small creatures. So I started crocheting these a few years before I began learning how to code, and I'm going to share a few of the connections that I've noticed between the two today. Um, so when I talk about crocheting in the context of this talk, I'm mainly referring to this style, but generally a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about can apply to other styles of crocheting as well. Um, also, every creature that you see throughout my slides, um, I handmade. So. <laughs> So crochet patterns are similar to programs. So this snippet shows a standard format of writing a crochet pattern. So when I first started uh, looking at crochet patterns, I felt like I was trying to read a foreign language. But just like I had to learn how to read and write code, I had to learn how to read and write crochet patterns. So if we take a look at a line of this pattern, it's telling us that on row five, we're going to increase for the first five stitches and then we'll say single crochet for the next two stitches. And once we're done with that row, we'll sh we should have a total of 12 stitches. Um, so an increase and a single crochet are both different types of stitches that you can do when you're crocheting. Um, e they each have their own instructions on how you work the yarn to form a stitch. So we can translate this into some simple code. So here I started writing a method to create a tail for a unicorn. Uh, as an example, for row five, I started my stitch count at seven, which is the number of stitches I should have after I complete uh, row four. I iterate through the range of one to my stitch count, and I either call an increase method or a single crochet method based on the result of my conditional. So really, a pattern is just a program, and you are the computer that executes the pattern to create a crocheted creature. So when I was first learning how to code, I used a lot of Stack Overflow and just copied and pasted the code right into my project. But since I'm an experienced developer now, I copy Stack Overflow and make sure I change the variable names. <laughs> <laughs> so on a similar note, 
as I gained more experience crocheting, I was able to alter some of the patterns I was using to, for example, make a bunny out of a monkey pattern. So I just changed the ears, I didn't make the hood or the tail, and I changed the mouth and the colors, and I created a different creature. So one of the worst things that happens to me when I'm crocheting is when I miss a stitch somewhere and the total stitch count for my row is off. I have to stop what I'm doing and try and find and fix my mistake. Luckily, each row in my pattern lists the expected number of stitches that I should have once I finish that row. So if I complete a row and I compare my actual stitch count to the expected stitch count that my pattern shows, and they don't match, I know that I failed my expectations. This is just like failing a test. But ultimately, one of the biggest similarities that I see between crocheting and coding is that there's this huge power to create. With just a few tools, a crochet hook and some yarn, or a laptop and some software, the possibility to create amazing things is endless. So if you look hard enough, you can find really cool similarities between coding and some of the other hobbies that you have. You can also carry over the skills that you've learned from one hobby to the other, such as problem solving. So I challenge you to find these connections because it can really be a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, so today I wanna to talk about the power of mentorship and I wanna do that by talking about my own story. So um, I love learning and I love computer science and programming and this is a picture of me during my first year of college in the computer labs during winter break. Um, looking at this now, I still can't believe that I went back to school during winter break um, to code in what we called the dungeon at UCSD. That's how much I loved programming. Um, but I want to go back a little further, pre-college. This is me as a baby, obviously not in college. Um, so real talk here, the circumstances of my upbringing were kind of rough. I grew up in poverty and my parents were refugees and their education was disrupted so they never even had the chance to finish high school. Um, so before college, I didn't even know what to expect. I didn't even know what a major was or computer science. And so when people ask me how I got into computer science, I really honestly say it's by chance. Um, so this is me again in college. Um, so as much as I was fascinated by computer science and programming, there were some days that I wanted to quit. And these, these were the days where I felt like I didn't belong. Um, one of my worst experiences was being told by a classmate that I didn't belong in the major, um, that I was taking someone else's spot in this impacted major, and that I wasn't even a good programmer, so I shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed in. Um, but, you know, luckily it wasn't enough to make me quit, and um, I, ne I ended up graduating with a degree in computer science, and shortly after, I began looking for software engineering jobs. Thank you. Um, so I began my search for a job a couple months after movements like Me Too and Time's Up were gaining traction, and women in tech were coming out and sharing their stories of sexual harassment in the workplace. And I wondered to myself, what, what am I getting myself into? I have deep empathy for people who experience any kind of harassment, especially sexual harassment, because I am also a survivor. Um, I can't speak on behalf of all survivors of abuse, but I can say that as a result of being abused, um, I lived a lot of my life with a sense of unworthiness. I had low confidence, and I felt really disempowered. Um, I was scared of other people, especially of men, and for a long time, I couldn't even leave my house. Um, but a lot of things, um, there were very few things that saved me, and one of the biggest things was coding. Um, coding was really fun, it was exciting, and it made me feel a little bit more in control of my world, and it empowered me. So, when I learned in college, that women in positions of power were being harassed in the industry, it made me feel very unsafe. I thought to myself, if women in the highest positions of power aren't safe, none of us are. 
As I applied to software engineering positions after college, I began mentally preparing myself for that reality because I thought I'd rather risk the potential of being harassed and maybe feeling a little unsafe than return to a life of poverty which entailed perpetual instability. I, I am now a software engineer at a company called Acorns and I'm also really proud to be a part of the Ruby community. Um, I wouldn't be here today without the support of my manager and my mentor, who I know would not tolerate any kind of behavior that would make people feel unsafe. Um, so seven months ago, I was living in poverty, and today I stand before you all in like the bougiest hotel I've ever been in, <laughs> um, in hopes that you will understand the power of mentorship. It was a mentor who encouraged me to go to college. It was a mentor who encouraged me to study computer science, and eventually a mentor who helped me become an engineer. And so um, mentorship is a big part of why I'm here um, at this conference in this industry with my skills. And mentorship will help me stay and help me succeed. And so this is for everybody, but especially for men in positions of power. We need you to actively work to make um, a safer space for people. Um, and one way you can do that is by being a mentor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Shermans, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. Um, I'm not, I've, I'm a student at Flatiron School, and I've been programming for less than a year, so thank you. Um, I'm not going to presume to talk about imposter syndrome from the experience of an experienced developer because I can't possibly understand that experience. Um, but if anybody here is new to programming, this is for you. Um, on the Flatiron Slack, I hear people talk about imposter syndrome all the time. I talk about imposter syndrome all the time. One person even said to me that she was really excited about building her first Rails app, but couldn't because her imposter syndrome set in. I think that we as beginners often misunderstand what imposter syndrome is, so I think we need to set some definitions first of all. Um, we all know that to be an imposter is to pretend to be someone or something that you aren't. Um, so imposter syndrome then is the feeling, is feeling like an imposter even though you are in reality fully qualified to do your job. Um, if so imposter syndrome requires experience, and if that definition is true, then that horrible, painful feeling that new programmers experience is, I think, better defined as the pain of being a beginner. Uh, it's the crippling sensation of not knowing enough or understanding enough to build something, and because of that, feeling like you don't belong. So. If from this moment forward you feel like you don't know enough, you need to understand that it's okay to not know something. It doesn't mean that you're a bad programmer. It doesn't mean that you're not a real programmer. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you'll never get it. And it doesn't mean you can't do it. And it simply means that you've been given an opportunity to learn something you didn't know before. So take that opportunity. Learn what you don't know and just start building. And I think that more often than not, if you just start building, you'll find that you knew more than you thought you did. And if from this moment forward you feel like you don't belong, you need to understand that you do belong. Programming belongs to the new people too. Um, and to back me up, I have a quote from Jen Weber. Uh, she said, if I ask you to show me some code you wrote and you can tell me a little about it, you can call yourself a programmer or developer or software engineer, etc. Put it on your resume. Don't listen to anyone who tells you that you don't belong. You do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kazumi Karbowski. I'm also a student at Flatiron School. I was born and raised on a small island in the south of Japan called Tokunoshima. I moved to San Francisco in 1998, and now I'm a mother of two little ones, and I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Before I had children, I worked in the hospitality industry I used to manage fine dining restaurants in San Francisco. I love the care and attention that um, attention to details it takes to run a stellar restaurant. 
When the guest had an exceptional dining experience, that's what made all the hard work and long hours worth it. When I became a mom, I knew the hours of the hospitality industry wasn't gonna work for me anymore. So I started to ponder a new career. After the birth of my boys, I've, be, I've remained a stay-at-home mom, and I've been working part-time from home. Raising a family remains the most challenging and amazing thing I've ever done. However, during this time, I started to feel like I was losing my own identity in everyday motherhood. As fate would have it, that's when my friend asked me to go to a lunch party of Moms Can Code. I had no idea what coding was then, but I just went looking at it as a night out with my friend. At the lunch party, I learned that Moms Can Code is an online and in-person community and program for people who want to develop their coding skills, their ideas, and professional networks. I met moms who are developers, some moms who are learning to be developers. I was so inspired by them, I went home and started looking for resources on learning to code. And that party was a year ago. In March this year, I found out I was awarded a scholarship from Moms Can Code that was paired with Flatiron School. Since then, I've been taking a full stack web development online course, and I am proud to say that I'm over halfway through the program. <laughs> Thank you. Moms Can Code is a very kind and supportive community, just like Ruby community. There is online, co online co-working hours, a virtual summit, hackathon, live coding lessons, as well as many different workshops. Moms Can Code has been helping me to move forward in my new career. It's so helpful to have such a um, supportive community, especially when you're learning to literally learn to write a new language. You do not have to be a mom to be a member. You do not have to identify yourself as a woman to be a member. And right now, they're looking for mentors. Moms Can Code is starting a new program called Develop Camp in January, and they're looking for freelancers, tech employees, and even startup founders who would be willing to dedicate three hours per month for three months, working with one of the participants to help guide, uh, create a plan of study that will help them reach their end goal. If you're interested in becoming a member or mentor or both, please visit momscancode.com or if you have any questions, I'll be here until Fridays, and I'll try my best to answer any and all questions you may have. So please come find me, or feel free to email me or tweet at me. Moms Can Code has changed my life. If I'm able to help just one person by having this talk, then the world will be that much better. Also, if you want any stickers or pins, I have some, so please come find me. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, the title of this talk is How to Be Standard. Uh, my name is Justin, I go by my last name, Searles, on the internet, that's what I look like uh, when I'm tweeting things. I come from a company called Test Double, uh, we're consultants, uh, we're, our mission in life is to join teams like yours and work alongside you and hopefully make your team code base better. Uh, I found in my travels at lots of clients over the years that programmers all seem to hate one thing, uh, just kind of based on what they uh, uh, argue about, and that's lint. Uh, uh, programmers hate lint, lint gets caught up in your code, it makes it slow and, and dangerous apparently. Uh, the most popular uh, linter that we've uh, got in our Ruby community is called RuboCop. Uh, it's called a cop because it yells at you a lot uh, for stupid reasons. Uh, uh, <laughs> And I'm a firm believer that like one of the things that Ruby has actually taught the rest of the community is that like the default settings of your library matter a lot for just the joy that programmers have. Why Rails was successful is because we don't spend all day just fighting inside of our configuration files. You know, Rails generally by default makes people feel happy. Um, Rubocop's defaults meanwhile make people feel like this new emoji. Uh, and 
And as a result, lots of teams end up just writing like lots and lots of custom one-off configurations. Uh, uh, you, you know, some people might call this bike shedding. If you don't know the phrase bike shedding, uh, uh, basically think of the software development lifecycle as going like, well, you have an idea, and then you spend time building a thing, and then you get in a cage match with all your coworkers to argue about meaningless trivia, uh, and then you make money with your successful product. And I, I was thinking about the <laughs> success. I was thinking about the software development lifecycle, and I was thinking, like, well, you know, is this step really that valuable? Like, if we got rid of this, you know, maybe uh, we could have more time just building stuff and then make more money, right? So, uh, again, also, like, another reason I'm ragging on RuboCop is it's the reason that my answer Sinatra was incorrect yesterday at Family Feud, and I'm still kind of sore about losing. Uh, uh, so when it comes to like talking about replacing the most popular linter, like this XKCD came to mind where it's like, well, there's like 14 competing standards, we need one universal one for them all, and now, so now there's just 15, right? Well, wrong. That's not what's gonna happen here because we, uh, uh, Ruby gem names are unique, and I, there's now just one standard, <laughs> and, and I own it. <laughs> Uh, so so uh, I'm a benevolent dictator for now because I really don't want to be worrying about this six months from now. Uh, in fact, uh, earlier today, if you saw Aaron, he's the one in the burger hat up, up in the front row, uh, he actually kind of pre-announced the library. Uh, I called it RuboCop, the good parts. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can gem install standard as the new standard library for Ruby. Uh, if, if you're not familiar, Standard is actually inspired by Standard JS, which is uh, created by Feroz a book DJ. It basically is just a unconfigurable thing on top of ESLint. So you get all the goodness of the engineering that goes into ESLint and none of the bike shedding and pointless ar argumentation about like what rules you should set because you're not allowed to change them. Uh, so Standard RB is the same thing. Uh, you just add it to your gem file, you bundle install, uh, then you bundle exec standard, uh, but that couldn't fit in one line, so I still use the alias BE when I don't have bin stub, so just be standard. Uh, and uh, after you ty type that and hit enter, if you see nothing, that means you win. Uh, 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 you can go check the exit code, it exited cleanly, you just don't worry about it anymore, it gets out of your way. Uh, if there is an error, it'll tell you, hey, you know, I can automatically fix a whole bunch of stuff, like this one here, so you run standard fix and it just goes away. Uh, so it's real nice out of your hair, and of course when you first add it to your project, you're going to get a whole bunch of different stuff, but standard fix will take care of most of them. Additionally, RuboCop only supports back to like 2.2, Ruby 2.2, but there's not, like as far as I can tell, a real reason for that other than they want to be aggressive about dropping support, but I want to support as much as possible. Uh, so uh, uh, I've hacked in a way to support libraries as old as like one still supporting 187, and that seems to work, so cool. Um, you, you get some common questions like, what if you don't like a rule? Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me that so far this week, and my answer is humans are very adaptable. <laughs> so, and if you really don't like a rule, basically you'll see it in the log messages too right now. Uh, open up an issue, talk about it. Because like a lot of people have been using RuboCop for a long time, we, we all have our little custom things. If you got one you feel strongly about, open up an issue, we'll have a discussion. Uh, the, the, the reason that I'm choosing to be the person to write standard is I literally don't care about any of this. Uh, uh, so I feel like that's a good arbiter of uh, one last cage match where we all argue about Ruby style and then as a community we can just get over it. Uh, you can find it up on uh, GitHub at our company testdoubles.org uh, slash standard. Hope you check it out. Uh, and uh, I'll be around, I'll be hanging out in the back if you want to chat about it. I got stickers and stuff, and so thanks a lot for having me. Hi. <laughs> I'm Jacob. We'll just go with that. I like that. Um, so how many of you have worked with Swagger before? Oh, let me am I audible now? There you go. Okay, awesome. How many of you have worked with Swagger before? Okay, keep your hands up. Um, those of you who have worked with Swagger, how many of you test your Swagger schemas? I see some, we see some, oh, I see hands on my team. That, that this makes sense. A few back there. Okay. Um, so LiveRamp, the company that I work for. Um, louder? We're not, getting, we're not getting your slides. Oh, we're, oh, we need my slides. I'm not getting your slides. Is that... Mind if I do? No, no, please oh, Okay. <laughs> like three seconds. Oh no, there's the mouse. Is the mouse over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which way am I going? Down? Oh, I got it. Got you, mouse. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. Are you on computer? 
Can anyone that knows how to computer raise your hand, please? Uh, uh, there we go. Yay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, okay. Oh, oops. Um, so, yeah, so LiveRAM, the company I work for, has an internal tool called Swagger Testing um, that is used for testing Swagger schema specifically. Um, and, and more broadly, uh, a Rails API end-to-end uh, -end via the Swagger schema. So those of you who aren't familiar with Swagger, uh, Swagger is a tool or a set of tools for standardizing documentation on APIs. And it comes with a whole suite of tools, including Swagger CodeGen, that allows us to generate a client in the language of our choice uh, that represents the schema we define in Swagger. So for example, if the Swagger schema contains um, you know, various routes and HTTP verbs and parameters to pass through those routes, we, we can generate a client that will have all of that information as a nice, handy method call so that it reads like, like readable code. It's very nice. Um, so here's a, a high-level overview. I've, I've oversimplified this on purpose for the sake of brevity. Um, you have your Swagger client, and your client is embedded in your code somewhere. You want to make an API call, hits a Rails server, the Rails server interacts with the back end in some way, there's a database involved, the back end returns some response, the Rails server renders JSON back at the Swagger client, and the Swagger client returns an object of some kind. That object is defined in your Swagger, Swagger schema. So when you are testing this workflow, um, if you're working with um, RSpec, uh, this is just my library of choice, although of course there are plenty of others, um, in RSpec we will, we will test uh, our code may be on the model, like the active record model, or module level, um, individual files, in which case we are covering exactly this portion of our workflow, um, starting with the interactions with the database and backend and ending there as well. Um, we can also test controllers. So controllers test your code from the point where you send information to the Rails application and then render a response back. So that's more comprehensive. Um, but if we're working with the native Rails tools, and we have a generated Swagger client, then we've added another point of failure to our code. So how do we test that? Um, we have a library called Swagger Testing, and Swagger Testing looks through your project for the generated Swagger code, initializes a client, exposes it in your RSpec suite, so you could just call it, and runs a test server in the background that interacts with the same database as the rest of your test suite. So you can just say, here's my client, call methods on it, expect this response to be what we like. And uh, this, ooh, the emoji was the, was the little yellow hand when I copy-pasted it there, but we have a slightly different one. Oh well, uh, that's fine. Life is, life is confusing sometimes. Um, so we like this uh, because it, it eliminates a bunch of common points of failure. If you're writing your Swagger schema and you write the wrong HTTP verb, for example, or you forget a parameter or you just make a small typo, this is the kind of thing that in order to test without tools like this, you have to you know, open up a Rails console somewhere and type it out manually if you want to make sure this actually works. Um, so it's very helpful to have automated testing. Here's an example of how this will work. Um, Swagger testing dot setup, that's one of two externally facing methods of this library. Um, you can pass it a number of options such as where your Swagger config file is, um, you know, what, there are a number of other options, they're all documented, um, but it's very simple. Um, then here's an example of an end-to-end -end test where you initialize your, your client, is, is just defined as client, swagger testing dot client, that is the second and only other externally facing method of this library. And then we're working with a potato service here. It's very important uh, business logic. Um, you're, you're getting a potato with your client uh, with the ID and you're expecting it to have these attributes. Um, and it reads just like a normal RSpec test, except in the background, you're actually hitting a real test server that's hitting the database and, and performing uh, exactly as your service would uh, if you were running it in production. Um, so that's my talk. Um, you can reach me by email. I actually don't tweet very much because I'm, I, I don't know, Twitter, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, my email's rmrfinbox at gmail.com. Um, you can get me on GitHub or LinkedIn, just Jacob Profts, or Jacob, rather. This is fine, too. Oh. Hi there, my name is Roman. I'm here to talk to you about feminism. Um, by the way, I, uh, I'm a software engineering manager at Square. I've been there for about two years. Uh, I've been a manager for about four or five years. Uh, I came up with this talk at this conference. The Square has not signed off on this, so yell at me if you don't like any part of it. Not at Square, please. 
Um, feminism is a word that a lot of people think is a scary word. Um, uh, people societally uh, sometimes try to avoid identifying with it, even while identifying with some of its ideals. Personally, I think that's a little bit silly um, because of how I, I relate to the word. I think it's something that more people should identify with very explicitly. And to explain why, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about how I first interacted with it myself. Uh, and it is at college, in college, where I took a, a femme theories class. Uh, it was with Scheimer, which uh, happened to be a school that shared uh, campus with my school. Uh, Anyway, long story short, I'm taking this class. I befriend a person there. Uh, and uh, we hang out a fair bit outside of class. And uh, I am a, a cavalier kind of gentleman. I like uh, doing things uh, for whether it's old ladies or women. And it's a script that I've learned since I was a little kid, since like my parents encouraged me to open doors at grocery stores for like people carrying groceries. Uh, and so in our interactions, I would always try to open doors for my friend. Um, and I started noticing that she doesn't actually uh, like that at all. And another uh, factor right next to that I noticed is that she always, whenever we're walking together, uh, stays a foot or two behind me. And if I ever uh, fall back, she makes sure to never be in front of me. And I'm not sure what happened to cause her, this behavior to her, but that behavior very, is very obviously a safety-oriented behavior, right? She, to be psychologically safe, wanted to be behind me to see where I am and what I'm doing. And when I open a door for somebody, that puts me behind them because they have to enter first. And so inadvertently, by following a script that I learned as a kid, I was actually putting somebody in a situation of psychological uh, kind of harm and feeling unsafe. And so for me, what feminism really is, uh, and this is a very personal definition, is a re-examination, usually by active listening, of personal and, personal and societal macros and how they negatively affect others. Um, super oversimplification, also feminism itself is a bit of a loaded term, intersectional feminism, uh, is one I like better over time, but moving on. Uh, let's talk about management. And the idea, uh, your role as a manager is no longer to ship code, it's to ship a team, right? And uh, what does it mean to be a team? A lot of management theory focuses on this idea that as a manager, you're responsible for your team's output. Um, I actually don't fully subscribe to this uh, definition. I think that a team is people helping each other. And your job as a manager is to get a team to help each other as effectively as possible because that makes them better than the sum of their parts. That makes them better than a bunch of individuals. It makes them a team. And the best way to get people to help each other effectively is feminism. It's re-examining your macros, re-examining how you're behaving in the presence of ac others and how your actions are uh, affecting others, using really active listening and using tools that I've learned from the feminism communities and a few other communities uh, to have more explicit, more active conversations about things that societally we tend to take for granted and we take, tend to do automatically, just like gentlemanly opening doors and actually ending up hurting people. Um, and so I want more and more people to take this approach to their everyday life and especially to work life because at work people can't get away from you. And if you're following a script you've learned as a kid that is actually ending up hurting somebody and they can't get away from you because they're on your team or they report to you, that's a real problem and you should try to talk about it and see if you can help make space for them. My name is Roman. Please come talk to me about this topic. I'm really, really passionate about it. Thank you. All right, I would like a quick show of hands. How many of you picked up one of these beautiful stickers? All right. Uh, keep your hand up if you know what Dev Empathy Book Club is. We got one, we got one, all right. So for the rest of you, <laughs> um, I wanted to just uh, very quickly tell you about uh, Dev Empathy Book Club, uh, who we are, what the stickers are, are really all about. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, Dev Empathy 
book club is about solving the now what problem. Uh, so this is something that's very familiar to us. You know, you go to a conference and hear a fantastic talk. You read a really interesting or intriguing blog, blog post or newspaper article. Um, you hear a, a, a podcast that changes a little bit the way that you think. And now what? How am I actually going to integrate this into my life? Uh, because the reality is that in order to, to make changes to how we interact with other people and, and how we live our lives day to day, um, it takes a whole lot of follow-up and it takes a concerted effort and a commitment. So Dev Empathy Book Club basically um, takes the, the inspiration that we have so much of in our community of, you know, from, from all, really all directions, you know, coming at us and saying, hey, we need to get better at, at soft skills, at, at how we interact with other people, um, at, at ethics, at how we build our teams. Um, and, and, okay, but how do we actually do this in the day-to-day -day, and how do we have a community that's gonna help us follow up on that? So Dev Empathy, Book Club aims to be the world's most supportive community of programmers committed to developing our empathy skills through study, discussion, and practice. Um, study meaning we have uh, we have a, a, a program of study that we you know that we follow in order to, to very very uh, regularly bring in new ideas. Um, but we don't just stop at reading things and learning things. We we actually discuss them with each other and we discuss them in the context of everyday life. We talk about our experiences. Uh, so over the past uh, year and a half, we've gone through a number of different books on a wide range of topics, general communications books, uh, books about how to form, uh, how to form better teams, um, things that are very close to code. Uh, pr pragmatic programmer is what we're doing right now. Um, we've gone into the world of design. We've gone into the world of management. Um, so it's really just, just this wide gamut of things, but developing a, a, a broader picture of the people around the code that we're, that, that we're writing every day. So what does that look like in terms of, of uh, you know, that, that's the study, but what about, uh, what about the other elements? So uh, we have weekly reading check-ins, uh, which means that, that every week we'll have a couple of questions that we'll throw out there, um, and people can respond with, uh, you know, with their thoughts, something related to the reading. You don't have to be doing the reading in order to answer the questions. We try to keep it pretty, pretty broad. Um, it would be awesome if everyone was doing the reading. We realize that uh, not everyone can commit to that immediately, um, where people might you know, kind of come in and out, but, um, but it's, it's a great way to just kind of have a, a, a topic to think about you know, every week. Uh, we also have a weekly experiences chat where people can come in, talk about things that they're struggling with, with right now or things that went really, really well. Um, and about once a month, we have a panel discussion uh, where, where the, the core panel will discuss different ideas coming out of the reading that, that we've, uh, we've been going through. If you want to find out more, you can check us out at devempathybook.club. We're on Twitter at devempathy. And uh, if you want to speak with me tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a Birds of a Feather uh, session at 1.50. Uh, that's the first slot of uh, Birds of a Feather sessions. Um, so you know, find me at any, any time. Uh, come to that, to that session. Uh, check us out online. Join the Slack. Um, there's lots of ways to reach out if you're interested. Um, and I, I hope to see a lot of you uh, in person or, or online. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie, and I am here to, uh, so first of all, uh, who watched Bianca's closing keynote yesterday? Yeah. How kick-ass was that, right? So um, one, of the, one of the things that she mentioned in her keynote and was uh, it, it, to, to help with a, a lot of these situations was Ruby for Good. Uh, who here has heard of Ruby for Good? Fantastic. Who's been to Ruby for Good? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So, if you've if, so if you've never heard of it, it is a weekend of civic hacking. Uh, every year at Ruby for Good, a uh, whole group of us get together to to work on projects to try to provide some benefit to communities around around the country and around the world. Um, uh, this this ha this happens well. Uh, this is, so this is a sample of uh, some of the projects that that we worked on just this year alone. Uh, we we worked on uh, so diaper banks across the country support families for for uh, support families who cannot afford diapers for their children. They their diapers are very expensive and not covered by financial assistance programs. Uh, so inventory tracking and partner apps were developed at Ru entirely by uh, developers at Ruby for Good and uh, open source contributors around uh, around the world. Uh, around the country, uh, rather, and are they're used by fi five of the major um, diaper banks around the around the country, uh, providing diapers for thousands of families uh, who would otherwise have to choose between diapers and feeding their families. 
Terra Stories is another, another one that, help, that helps digitize the traditions of oral storytelling in an, uh, indigenous and other traditional communities in the Amazon rainforest, uh, making their history indelible and allowing knowledge of them to spread. New Sanctuary Coalition is an organization that fights for the rights of immigrants and their families resisting detention and deportation. Uh, as a result of selectively applied immigration policies, providing services like accompaniment uh, and bond programs and pro se legal clinics. Um, the, uh, the Playtime Project aims to nurture healthy child development and reduce the effects of trauma among children living in temporary housing programs in Washington, D.C. And so this is just a, a sample of some of the projects that we worked on this year alone. Um, the flagship event is held every year in, in Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia area. Uh, starting last year, there was, uh, we started running a, uh, an event in Portland for, so that Python developers could get in on the action. And, uh, but nothing, none of, none of that, like, nothing compares to the level of excitement we've gotten from the Ruby community. This year, tickets sold out for Ruby for Good, the, the DC event, in nine days. So Ruby developers love giving back to the community so much that we had to kick off a second uh, event uh, uh, kicking off in the San Francisco Bay Area called Ruby by the Bay in spring of 2019. So we're gonna have Ruby for good on both sides of the country. And so this is, this is not a hackathon. You don't go into and try and uh, cram as much work as we can into a 48 hour span to try and compete for some prizes. That's, that's not the, the, what this event is. Instead, we, we just work with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of our friends um, for a reasonable number of hours a day and and then for the rest of the time, we just spend hanging out with our friends. Like you, you make friends at Ruby for good. You make friends in real life. So, and because it's not a hackathon, like these projects that are out there, they live on as open source and can and collect contributions from people around the world. For more information uh, and to get involved, rubyforgood.org. You can join the Slack channel. Um, there are se uh, several frequent Ruby for good attendees here. Um, either myself. Uh, Betsy, over here, has a, you've been to all of them, haven't you? Yes. Uh, so, like, there are there are plenty of us here. Uh, come come uh, ask us if you have any questions, um, uh, and uh, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Is Aaron here? He knows what I'm going to be doing. Okay. If he's not here, okay. So, why do we have lightning talks? We have lightning talks to make fun of our friends. And I have been really wanting to play around with some ML tools. And so I made an ML uh, machine learning model that tries to tell the difference between tender puns and real Aaron Patterson tweets. <laughs> and here's the terrifying part, it worked. <laughs> so I started with the training set, uh, copied and pasted from Twitter because you can't batch download from Twitter without an enterprise license. So I have things like, if, I feel like if C-level executives studied harder and got better grades, they could be A-level executives. <laughs> and in the more serious thing, and I'm using uh, one of the Google products, AutoML Natural Language, which is in public beta if you want to go dork with it yourself. Uh, a serious one. Um, I think my new superpower is the ability to still be tired even though we turned our clocks back. <laughs> so I created a small data set. Uh, there's 38 records, and if you've ever done any machine learning, that is freakishly small. Don't do that. They recommend 100 lines, but I did not have enough time to copy and paste that. <laughs> uh, and we get to see how slow my browser is. So this is the trained model that I got back. Uh, training a model took about four hours. It ran during the day. If you were at registration, when the e I got the email saying the model was done, you got to hear me have a happy dance very loudly. <laughs> and so the model isn't great. Um, precision and recall are only about 75%, so those are the rates of, those are a measure that indicates how likely you are to get false positives and false negatives. But here's the fun part, let's use it. So I pulled some tweets that I did not use in my training set because I am not cheating. So today's lesson, don't airdrop cats to the person giving a presentation. And this comes back with a 0.73 rating of serious. Pretty good. Um, let's try, oh, let's try aren't LAN parties a type of networking event? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that comes back at a 1.0 rating of fun. <laughs> So I think machine learning is super cool and awesome and fun and really powerful. And here's the thing, it's actually a lot of the techniques are very, very approachable. So I have two things to say and then I'm gonna get off stage. One is uh, further applications of this fantastic bit of not actual any coding that I did. There was no code involved, it was all through the UI. Uh, we could write a Twitter bot that just retweets Tender Love's puns so that you don't have to get any of his serious content about Ruby at all. <laughs> or the inverse, but why would you do that? <laughs> and then the second thing is, if you're interested in machine learning, I just tweeted, and my Twitter is the underscore Thagomizer. You can see it here. I'll embiggen. Embiggen, embiggen. That's how you spell Thagomizer. Uh, it's the spiky part at the end of a Stegosaurus. I just tweeted a link to this page. These are three blog posts I did on some really basic machine learning in Ruby, if you want to check it out. If you find this content useful and want me to do more of it, please let me know, because then I will. Because blogging into a vacuum is really kind of sad and boring. Thank you all. So um, I've talked about this at kind of conferences all over the country for a couple years, but uh, I think Crystal Lang is really cool. I think I've, I've been hearing a lot like for the last few years, like people are doing Go, people are doing Rust in certain cases because they don't feel like uh, Ruby is fast enough. That may or may not actually be true, but um, Crystal is another great option if you don't want to go like too far into the foreign land of Go or Rust. Um, that being said, um, there's like a full featured uh, web framework very similar to Rails that like myself and quite a few other smart people have built over the last uh, couple years. It's called Amber Framework. If anybody would like to start it, I would not argue in any way. Um, that being said, let's look at some code and discuss um, encryption. So this isn't really uh, in any way crystal specific. In fact, it mostly looks like Ruby. Um, this is called helping humans visualize encrypt and encryption strength. So here's the code. Um, I already LS'd it, so you know, save some time. It's limited. Um, so I'm gonna open that up. So hopefully, can you see the text? Is it too tiny? Okay. How about now? Okay. Bigger? Okay, there we go. Okay, so basically I'm taking in, requiring some stuff, taking in a parameter, great variable name, you're welcome. Um, if nothing's passed in, I yell at you. Uh, coming down here, I create like, okay, so really, really quick, what I'm doing is I'm loading in a bitmap file, and with that bitmap file, I'm extracting the header, which basically says what color space is this, uh, how, what is the resolution, et cetera. I'm removing that because we need that so that we can visualize the image later. Um, and then I'm doing something really simple. I'm just uh, taking in a password with a simple encryption right here, and I'm zoring every byte to be what that password is, which is one of the simplest forms of uh, encryption. Uh, down further, I actually use uh, OpenSSL's uh, crypto uh, to try out multiple encryption methods on the same bitmap. After encrypting them, I save the bitmap so that we can see what it looks like. Uh, I will uh, stop showing you code here really soon. Um, this is just saving the simple one. This is unencrypting the simple one since it's a reversible encryption method. Uh, and then this is using ECB, which is a pretty standard one in SSL. Uh, for not anymore, but it was really standard. Uh, Internet Explorer still forces you to use it in some cases. Um, here's CBC, which is what Rails uses uh, for encrypting its uh, encrypted secrets, I believe. Um, and then CTR and uh, GCM are other fairly good choices. I'm going to run that and show you the output really fast. Cool, so I'm encrypting an image called Superman BMP, and I will show you really fast in the finder. Oh no, pretty sure that ran. Um, here, I'll just open it again. There, that's better. Okay, so make that bigger too. I can't, sorry. Um, so the original image here is called a Superman BMP. It looks like this, you may have seen it before. Um, 
If you go look at the first one, this is a simple encryption. All I did was just absorb the bytes with a random string, uh, like so password much secret, I believe. And as you can tell, it obscured it, but you can tell, still tell what it is. If that was ASCII, you probably couldn't tell what it was, but machine learning algorithm could probably find a pattern. Um, if we look at this next one, this is uh, ECB, which is actually still used by uh, older versions of Internet Explorer that are still in use today. And therefore, to be backwards compatible, our Net Nginx has to support it with OpenSSL, TLS, which can be an issue. As you can see, you can still make out the Superman logo. Um, let's go down to uh, CBC, which was what I talked about with like encrypted uh, sessions. Um, in this case, you really can't make out what's happening. Uh, the reason for this is that it takes what's called an initialization vector, which is usually the same block size as your secret, and it zores it across the result of the first encryption, takes the output of that and zores it against the next block and so on all the way to the very end. Okay, so my time's up. Thanks, guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Zach. Um, I would like to talk briefly about HyperStamp, making HyperCard and Ruby again, sort of. Uh, all right, let's go. So last year, um, I gave a talk at RubyCalf about uh, HyperCard and making it um, in Ruby. It was an OK talk. Um, I also talked about uh, the history of the application and Bill Atkinson, um, its designer and creator. Um, I used a Ruby GUI tool called Shoes um, to make the prototype. <sighs> can't really see now. Uh, I'm going to click through a bunch of these. Um, so HyperCard, if you haven't used it before or heard of it, basically it was like making a web page but not connected to the internet, uh, but you could edit it like it was a PowerPoint slide, um, and it allowed you to do a lot of cool stuff with uh, some programming as well. So like this is an example of an address book. You can type stuff in, you can make buttons that click around, and you can script it all up. So it was very revolutionary for the time. Um, and. Uh, Pretty cool app. So the Ruby Shoes version, um, or you know, what would it look like if made by a bad programmer? Um, it had buttons and text and uh, some scripting with Ruby. I didn't try to remake the scripting language that um, HyperCard used, but uh, so that worked okay. Um, not a lot of stuff worked, and a lot of the meat and potatoes of HyperCard was unimplemented and. Finally, I was somewhat unhappy because um, Shoes 4 uses uh, JRuby and uses the Eclipse SWT library for all the widgets. And um, as I got deeper into making the stuff, I wasn't super excited about messing with that. So um, that's where we were. And then I dropped it soon after uh, RubyConf. And then let's see if I can see over here now. Um, I began rewriting it uh, in July of 2018, so a couple of months ago. And uh, now we're here again, and I'm telling you about an unfinished implementation of HyperCard. So that's, that's good. Um, all right, so why did I try to rewrite it? Well, uh, last year I saw um, a talk uh, about Ruby 2D. And uh, it's created by this guy, Tom Black, who I think is here. I see his name on the board. Can you stand up, Tom, if you're here? There he is. Everybody clap at that man. Clap him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's a really cool little uh, Ruby library for rendering uh, 2D stuff in text. Um, so let's see, where are we at? Step one, um, it uses simple 2D under the hood, which is a C library, also written by that man. Um, yeah, yeah, you can clap at him all day. Clap at him, clap. Uh, <laughs> All right, so it allows you to render all the stuff that you might need to make a HyperCard kind of thing, um, and uh, games, whatever. I would suggest looking at Ruby 2D and Simple 2D if you like C. All right, so uh, fun challenges of making a HyperCard clone. I'm going to click all these at once. Um, Basically, when you have just rendering primitives like shapes and text and, and uh, not much else, you kind of have to recreate everything. So you have to create buttons and text fields. Uh, the text field is like lines of text where you have to do cursor movement and all that kind of stuff. It's actually funny. There's a GitHub issue right now on Ruby 2D. Uh, someone asked how to do buttons with Ruby 2D. So I can share some of my terrible code with them. Um, also, you need Z indexing so things can sit on top of each other. All that stuff, uh, you know, drag and drop, resizing elements, it all has to be done uh, sort of by hand. OK, so HyperCard, um, no longer calling it that. I'm calling it HyperStamp. And the reason is that um, 
I want to keep the window size very small. I want it to be cute and limited. Um, I think it's like 640 by 480 right now. Uh, only shades of gray. Um, I decided to do without color for right now. And uh, I want it to feel like making stacks of note cards with a pen. So that's a screenshot. That's the size of the thing. And uh, it's not going to get any bigger than that. OK, I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, yes, you can see something. All right, so this is just a couple of screenshots to give you a feeling of what I, I kind of how I, I've been using this thing. Um, there's my face. Uh, those are some buttons. Uh, you know, you can make little like text. You have um, all that kind of stuff. It's still early in the implementation, but I'd like to keep going. Uh, the code is very, very messy. It um, is a giant blob of text, and RuboCops hate them. So uh, <laughs> just if you like giant blobs of text, it's got it. Um, all right, so you could go to my thing. It's MHC. Uh, Ruby 2D is right there. It needs cool stuff. It, you can do whatever you want, for real. Like, there's so many things to be done here with hyperstamp, so feel free to get involved. Um, finally, ViperCard. If you look that up on the internet, that's a whole recreation of ViperCard in JavaScript. ViperCard. Try that out. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Junichi. I'm from Japan. And are you enjoying RubyConf? Yeah. yeah. That's me too. Yes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, unhappy exception handling. Uh, but this is my first English speech. Uh, so it will be a big challenge for me. Uh, but I'll give it a try. Uh, let's begin. Uh, so uh, now talk about the basic syntax of exception handling in Ruby. Um, probably all of you n uh, understand the syntax, uh, begin, rescue, and OK. Yeah. Uh, it is very simple, but some programmers misuse exception handling. They misunderstand. If exception happens, use rescue. That's OK. <laughs> uh, they begin writing rescue everywhere, rescue, 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 and they believe my program is not reliable. <laughs> is it OK? No, yes, no. But some years ago, uh, I had a trouble at a previous job. I joined a previous company as an in-house software engineer, and I became the maintainer of an existing in-house web application. It was a good boy because it had been running perfectly for years. But one day, I had an opportunity to talk with one of the users. He showed me his regular operation, and I was watching it. He clicked the Save button. Then I saw a dialog. System error minus one. Oh, what? What's this? He said. Oh, we see it very often. So we are clicking the Save button again, again, again. Click, 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 click. <laughs> are we ready? <laughs> That code was like this. And actually, it was not red. Uh, that was ASP.NET in C sharp. But um, basic idea is not different, and they are the same. So I remember that was an update logic, and it has a rescue clause, unnecessary rescue clause. And this is unhappy exception handling. It just display error code. And it needed a notified no load, so we never noticed even if an error occurred. And unfortunately, the users had a bad procedure. If you get this error, keep on retry. No, <laughs> do not retry. Please call us. <laughs> and after the investigation, we found the root cause. Uh, it was deadlock. Deadlock was involved so frequently uh, due to a bad table design. Have you ever seen a table without primary keys? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> no, OK, anyway, uh, this is a conclusion. What can we learn from this story? First, and the misuse of exception handling with terrible consequences. And second, what you can do and what you should do or what you shouldn't do are different. And third, if you don't have confidence in exception handlings, uh, please do not use rescue so casually. And delegate exception handling to frameworks, uh, for example, Reds uh, displays on a 500 page or save logs. And 
Uh, please consider asking mentors to, uh, for help about your code design. So uh, let's do happy exception handlings. Finally, uh, introduce, let me introduce myself. My name is Junichi, and you can call me Jun. I'm working uh, as a software engineer at a Japanese company called Sonic Garden, and I'm mainly developing Rails applications. I have Twitter and GitHub account, and uh, I have some personal works. I translated an ebook called Everyday Rails Testing with Artspec. Do you know this book? Oh. Great, great, great. Yes, uh, I translate it. And I wrote a book called Introduction to Ruby Programming for Future Professionals in Japan uh, last year. And uh, key concept is uh, learn Ruby uh, before Rails. Um, Mats kindly wrote the forward message uh, for this book. Um, I'm looking for English publisher, so if you know, uh, Please introduce uh, him or her uh, to me. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, thank you very much. See you. Hey, how are everybody? Uh, how are you all doing? I am uh, Tom Black. I go by Black TM uh, most places on the internet. And I'm pretty much a typical uh, uh, Ruby developer, except I like to kind of hack on the fringes there. And so, yes, it's true, I did give a talk uh, last year about. Uh, Ruby 2D and uh, building this with uh, some some friends online and it is a it's kind of already been introduced but it's a gem for 2D graphics and <laughs> game development and all the rest of it it kind of looks like this uh, it's got a nice DSL you can just uh, you know create shapes and give it some attributes and everything and, and then you just get a window it's pretty easy uh, so some cool games you can build with it um, is that playing oh yeah this is by uh, Antoine kind of cool uh, it's, it's not playing. Anyways, let's see. Oh, I don't know. Oh, that's playing. So, uh, yeah, just some examples here. This is uh, Saurabh. He's uh, been uh, building some cool games here. There's like a typing thing and built a, um, what is this, like a matching kind of thing there? Pretty cool. I've got to get a good style here. Not just games. You can do some UI things. I wasn't really intending for it because it kind of leans on the game side. But, uh, yeah, this is like a color picker, which is pretty, uh, pretty fabulous. And then he also made something for, for Halloween, so it's just really cool examples. He's a pretty creative guy. So I just thought I'd share what's new and also you know, give, maybe give you some inspiration here. So uh, added sprites. We kind of had that a little, a little bit already, but finally kind of polish it off. And if you're not familiar with like this stuff, it's kind of like a digital flip book, and it's pretty essential for 2D games. So you got uh, kind of a nice API there, and you can describe what it is. And then, uh, yeah, you got the sprites there. Also rotation. Kind of an obvious thing, but these things are harder than they seem. So there you go. That's our test card there. Things <laughs> rotating. Very exciting. Uh, circles, which was uh, an interesting challenge. You know, it's the first curved shape. And you might think, oh, it's the big deal. But this is my first attempt. And so it's like, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got, I was never really good at math. But I don't even know. This, this failed in a lot of different ways. So. But the challenge is under the hood, it's like these are sectors, and so like, you know, a lot, there's a lot of lies in 2D graphics and stuff, and so this is like how you kind of do that stuff with these primitives. Um, so now we have circles and you can do fun stuff. You know, and another the random things like window icons, kind of neat. Uh, more controller support, so kind of already had that, but thanks to some low-level improvements, you can do mapping and other things, and like just detect stuff out of the box. We use SDL at the lower layer, and there's been improvements there, so. Uh, if you're getting a controller, get, check out 8BitDo. I'm not sponsored. I wish I was, but they make cool controllers and stuff. Uh, iOS and tvOS, it's neat to see your uh, Ruby apps running on there. That's all thanks to mRuby, which is kind of cool. So lots of improvements, and, and just wanted to yeah, thank everybody who's contributed code and ideas, and it's a fun community. So what might be next? Well, we've got like an issue with, or uh, lots of issues with feature requests and enhancements and ideas, and you know, we're just like hacking about, uh, around this stuff. and so. Uh, there's a couple things I'm excited about. WebAssembly is one. Uh, you might think, is that possible? Yeah, I wrote a blog post about it. So you can have a link to that. And that's also done in MRuby, which is cool. So you can see it running in the uh, JavaScript console there. And it was also uh, translated to Japanese. So if that's your language, there you go. Um, I don't speak Japanese, but I might learn just by reading my own blog post now. So that's pretty cool. Uh, also bringing some interactive things. So this is a console kind of sort of using things based on IRB and all the rest of it. And so you can you know, hear just like uh, kind of in real time changing some of the graphics elements there. So it's kind of cool. So that was neat, but I was really motivated to do this 
uh, because of this little guy. Anybody seen the, the Tello drone before? This is a programmable drone. You should know about it. It's pretty sweet. So this is the fun I was having in the hotel room. So you can stream all this data. There's a lot of data coming out of this thing. So that makes it convenient. Uh, and then here I was at 7 a.m. this morning trying to take this thing off. And uh, sorry if I woke you up. So, and if you want to know what to do with that extra double bed in your hotel room, yeah. So you can see it's taking off and it's turning and I've got, yeah, this is, uh, I think I can read that. Yeah, cl uh, clockwise and then, and then flipping. There you go. So it's a cool, yeah, this is sweet. So, and it's all done in Ruby and I'll release a gem and I'm working on that. So if this stuff is interesting to you, not just 2D, but just, you know, want to kind of get outside your boring Rails apps, you know, you can do that. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, yeah, we're on Gitter uh, and GitHub and we're friendly folks. We're all amateurs. We really know what we're doing. So it's fun to hack on all that stuff. And if you go to blacktm.com, that's where uh, my, my uh, site is with all the links to everything too. And I want to give a shout out to Ryan Davis who gave a talk about his graphics jam. That's more like the simulation side and kind of doing vector stuff. But that's really cool too. So there's a lot of weird people doing interesting things. Hang out with us. <laughs> Uh, so my talk is the second wave of imposter syndrome, which is a uh, more appropriate title than I'd originally planned. So thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, so I want to give some context to for the way I experience imposter syndrome, uh, just a little background about myself. Um, I'm a full stack developer at LiveRamp, um, and I uh, write a lot of Ruby and JavaScript. And it, significantly, I have about two years of experience. Um, and uh, that means like I'm kind of learning how to do things, but there's still a whole lot I don't know, and that's dangerous territory for experiencing imposter syndrome. Um, I like to think of imposter syndrome as kind of a curve. Uh, it's not a static feeling that you feel the same way all the time, um, but uh, it, it like kind of ebbs and flows over time. Uh, I think a lot of people maybe feel the same way about imposter syndrome as I do, uh, kind of like 18 months into my career, I was actually feeling pretty good. I was like a knew a little bit about Rails, uh, and then I had to learn a bunch of new stuff, and all of a sudden you feel uh, worse again. At the top of that curve, you're like this awesome programmer uh, with all the power of Ruby at their fingertips, but then you end up <laughs> as like two kids uh, <laughs> stacked on top of each other in a <laughs> trench coat at the bottom of the curve, and you really don't know uh, if you belong where, where you're at. Um, I want to talk about the peak of the curve. Um, that I think that's kind of an important moment on the curve, and I want to share a little anecdote about, about an experience I had. Uh, maybe not really at the peak of a curve, and, but the curve, but just somewhere kind of along the line. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an example of error output of a time when one of our builds was failing. Um, we have a dependency on a gem called curb, uh, and we were unable to build its native extensions. Uh, I hope that this is a similar experience for uh, some of the more junior people out there, but when I see a .c file, I uh, know only one response, uh, which is, of course, to panic. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the time for me to bring in a guru. Um, and I brought in a guru to help me figure out how to resolve this issue with compiling these extensions. Um, and before I was even able to figure out where this dependency was included from, he had already opened a pull request to the upstream uh, repository, like repairing the native extensions, which was crazy. Um, and then he emailed, or and then he slacked me, uh, and let me know that it turned out it was actually really easy. Uh, it was pretty impressive seeing this happen, um, but like kind of hearing that this was so easy uh, <laughs> was a little intimidating for me. And I found myself sliding down this curve again. Uh, I think that like this was a moment when I kind of lost faith in my problem-solving abilities because like I was at a loss um, and shackled for like trying to address this type of problem. Um, and this is kind of the significant moment, I think, for me uh, of, of like what I want to express in this talk is, is I just want to say like what I did here to recover. Um, so I think this is the time to get back on the horse. Um, and at, at this moment, I kind of leaned back onto the problem solving skills I had and solved the problem the way that I would, uh, the, the, the way that I would have solved it. Turned out curb was actually not a real dependency. Uh, it just happened to be in a gem spec somewhere. The fix was only one line. And I, I knew how to do that, um, and I did it. And it was awesome, and I felt a little bit better. And, and then I went and uh, like looked at my coworkers changes, and he was right. They were actually kind of easy. I never would have thought of them myself, but uh, I, I could understand them, and that was really cool. Um, so I want to go back to this curve. Um, this is kind of like the micro-level curve. Uh, it, this may be the first couple years of a career. 
Um, and the curve can kind of look like this uh, if you keep slipping back down to the bottom. Um, but I think if you recover soon enough, um, the curve can end up looking a lot more like this over your career. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to encourage people who are in a similar boat to me to just uh, remember to trust your problem solving skills and, and then go off into the unknown and, and figure out, learn something new. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Antoine, and I'm a software engineer at LiveRamp, which is one of the sponsors, by the way, of the conference. So. And today I want to talk to you about unplanned refactoring, which is something I had to deal with recently. So for more context, LiveRamp is a 12-year-old company. It's been very successful, and it's still very successful. It's going through a hyper-growth stage, which means it has a legacy code base and some legacy code you have to deal with. So I want to talk to you about my experience working with this legacy code. So sometimes you get a ticket, and you have to go and work with this legacy code. And sometimes that code is untested, it's procedural, which makes it hard to understand and hard to change. So you can see me going in this code, like I have to fix this ticket, I have to implement this feature, and I'm trying to gain context like about the code, and this is how I feel. I'm a little freaked out. <laughs> So my solution is, well, I should just refactor this code. So what I mean by I should refactor this code is first, if the code is untested, I should test the current behavior. Then I should, uh, I should use object-oriented design in order to make the code like, easy to, easier to understand and easier to change. So how do I do this? The first thing that I try to leverage is discipline. And you need a lot of discipline because if the code is procedural and untested, it's kind of daunting to go and refactor it in order to make your change later. So the thing that I really like to use as a tool is pair programming. You can bring someone in, and this way you can share the burden with them. You can have two brains working on one problem, and you can also hold yourself to higher standards by having a pair with you. And also you can keep each other motivated. The other thing I like to do, and that's very valuable, is work uh, in incremental steps. So the first thing I do usually is if I need to add a test, I'm going to add a very small test. I just start somewhere. And the key is really like to start somewhere. The other thing that I like to do is naming things. Sometimes it's very useful to just you know, introduce some local variables and name things or extract a block of code to a method and then use that method in, in your code. So The other thing that's very important is team culture. I'm lucky enough that I'm on a team that uh, values code quality and that makes you feel empowered to make these changes. Because if you have a ticket, um, refactoring the code is going to take time first. So I think that it's important to have a team that fosters code quality in order to make you feel empowered. And also my team sees pair programming as a best practice, so it's easy for me to go and grab someone to pair with me on this. Um, but if your team is not like this, you can always shape the culture of your team and maybe introduce some talks uh, from Sandy Metz, for example, or read her books. They're great. Then the other thing that I think is important is to have this team culture, you're going to need to have a company culture that makes uh, its developers feel empowered. And at LiveRamp, we're lucky enough to have something called Hack Week, which is every quarter we get one week and we can hack on anything we want. We can explore new technologies, we can refactor code, we can do whatever we want. And that, personally, that makes me feel empowered, and that translates into my team culture as well. And the other thing that uh, we do at LiveRamp, too, is we have trainings. Just uh, over the summer, we had a training to learn about event-driven uh, microservices in order to improve our architecture. So that makes me feel empowered, and I think it makes my team feel empowered. And so we can include these refactorings in our tickets before we have to change the code in order to make the code better and the system better. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Scott, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't know why you do that, though. Uh, but I want to talk today about something that most of us developers uh, struggle with, find slightly annoying, a, a minor daily or weekly nuisance that we deal with, and that specifically is recruiters. Um, can you see? Yeah, OK. So uh, we all get those cold emails from recruiters that clearly haven't read our resumes or LinkedIn profiles out of the blue, uh, saying they need someone with five years of experience in Java for a position having to do with Java scripting. Um, so I thought, you know, this is a minor nuisance. This is moderately annoying. Uh, and I'm going to fight fire with fire here. So what else is moderately annoying? Comedians. 
Uh, specifically, amateur comedians, of which I am one, and therefore I have many friends who also are. <laughs> Uh, and if you're in comedy circles or have friends who are comedians, your Facebook is going to start looking like this, with invites to shows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, fun fact, if you ask a bunch of comedians to invite you to their shows so you can do a bit for a conference, they will happily oblige. Uh, so anyway, I decided I'm going to start inviting all of these recruiters to my improv shows. <laughs> Uh, so great, here's my first option, want to save the world. Yeah, I do. Uh, something about a company, this awesome company, because they, or this is an awesome company because they make easier for blah, 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 blah. So I respond, uh, thanks for reaching out. I'm not looking for any opportunities, but I'm actively looking for members for my, or audience members for my improv show. Uh, <laughs> this is an awesome group because we make history fun and accessible instead of blah, 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 blah. Um, if that sounds like something you or someone you would know might be interested in, please let us know. Uh, so I said, if that sounds like something you or somebody you know would be interested in, you can get tickets for our show here. Uh, we also have other Ruby on Rails opportunities as well as front end roles that could be a good fit too. Looking forward to hearing from you. I also have other shows that aren't history. Looking forward to seeing you in the audience. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, so this, this happened a lot. Uh, I would do this quite a lot. My coworkers got to see the most of this in Slack. Um, but then this happened, uh, and someone actually knew someone, and I'm like, okay, uh, Boston's a small town, maybe I'm being a bit of a jerk here, and I need to, like, back up a little bit. So I'm like, okay, let's give everyone fair warning. I'm going to put it right in my LinkedIn profile that if you send me an email, I'm going to respond with an invite to my improv show. <laughs> fair warning. Well, it turns out people do read the header on your uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, so I think the bit has officially died, but now I have a good screening mechanism for who actually reads my profile, so that's nice. Um, and unfortunately, no one has actually made it to see any of my improv shows. Now, you might be asking, hey, Scott, this sounds great and all, and I have lots of recruiters emailing me, but I'm not a comedian. What can I do? Well, next time you get an email from a recruiter, you should invite them to my improv show. <laughs> uh, please don't all go to that domain at once because it's just a free Heroku dino and it will probably die. <laughs> uh, anyway, stay tuned for my next talk using similar strategies for canvassers and your podcast. <laughs> Thank you, I've been Scott Istvan. Uh, you can find out more about my show, Improv History, at improvhistory.com or my podcast, Comedy Keys, uh, at comedykeys.com. Please like and subscribe. Wow. <laughs>